everyone. Good evening. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ai Han Nguyen. I am the engagement lead for the Social Instabilities for Labor Futures initiative here at Data and Society. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, Data Society and for this final talk in this year's series on labor. Um, tonight, we are joined by Lois Hyman, Cornell professor and author of Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Welcome, Lois. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me here today at Data and Society, which is doing amazing work, I think better than anywhere else, in thinking about what this all means. Um, so today, I am going to talk about this very yellow book that I wrote. Um, and I'd like to start with a simple idea, that Uber is the waste product of the service economy. And what do I mean when I say that? Um, well, I think often when we talk about Uber, or digital jobs more generally, there is a fiction of separation, as if this is cordoned off from regular work, as if the old economy was good, the world of W-2s, um, and this new kind of work is bad, as if traditional work was still good work. The history I'm gonna tell you today is about the breakdown of that old work. But I think it's important to realize that for so many people, that old economy is still bad work. It's the insecurity of slinging lattes, of being a greeter at Walmart. And this distinction we draw is important because it's this distinction that is at the foundation of technological exceptionalism and the ways in which we think about this new economy because technology is central to the story that is being told about our economy today. That it's, and there's a way when we talk about technology that it seems inevitable. That technology drives social change and that there's nothing we can do about it. We are at the mercy of progress. So the story I'm telling you is about organization, not automation. And one of the central ideas of the book is that technology solves for social relationships. Social relationships. That it solves for a world that is already in existence rather than invent the world anew. In fact, social change, as most historians would agree, is typically driven by decisions about how we make and organize our world. The way we make use of technology. So I'm a historian. I don't know how many historians come to Data and Society, and so I'm very happy to be here today. But this is, um, I take you a little story. So when you guys were all in school, I'm sure you learned about the Industrial Revolution, right? You learned about steam engines, you learned about railroads, and you were told that this is what made capitalism advance, that this is the story of the future, these technological innovations. Well, historians talk about something before the 19th century, before this technology, called the Industrious Revolution in the 18th century. Because when I tell you this, suddenly it'll all be very obvious. That's the thing with history. Once I tell you the story, it's very obvious. The idea is this, that before you can use technology to solve for workplaces, you have to have a workplace. People come into one building, they begin to weave together, they begin to uh, spin uh, different kinds of uh, yarn and things like this. Well, this is, this is the industrious revolution. They begin to make pottery together. This industrious revolution of the 18th century had no technology outside of the reorganization of social relationships. And in fact, the industrial revolution of the 19th century solved for a workforce that was already inside, that already was being managed that already was being surveilled. And it's this idea that is so central to understanding what we're going through today. Because in a lot of ways, we're going through what I think is the second industrious revolution. That the AI and technology and everything around us is not particularly different from other kinds of productivity tools in the past. Think about the mechanical thresher. 
the reason why we're all here today inside as opposed to harvesting in the fields is because of the mechanical thresher. This is something that eliminated nearly all labor in agriculture. So it's not that machines are new or technology is new. What's new is the breakdown of the corporate workplace over the last 50 years. And with it, the security that we have long pegged to that employer-employee relationship. So this is, this is a very contrarian view, I think, in a lot of ways, to the typical narrative that we're getting. Now, this traditional work, of course, was not very traditional at all. Um, you know, the factory, the industrial workplace that we're so nostalgic for now on both the left and the right, this was, for most of the history of industrialization, an excellent place to go if you wanted to be poor, if you wanted to lose an arm, uh, if you wanted to work alongside your children, this was a great place to go for those kinds of activities. No, this industrial economy was made valuable by organization of workers. And this is a crucial um, corrective to a lot of the stories we hear these days, that it's about laws, it's about do-gooders passing laws from above and making the world a better place for workers. Well, the real story of the 1930s is a story of industrial workers taking power from that of industrial corporations. The industrial unions were illegal. They did illegal activities. The most famous of this was the Flint sit-down strike in 1936, which I write about in the book, where workers got together in the middle of one particular plant at General Motors, and this is in the middle of the Great Depression. GM's the largest corporation in the world, and they shut down its supply chain by occupying the space. This isn't just kumbaya, this is people organizing together. And they want. They won. And over the next few years, there were fights back and forth, um, starting with the auto workers and spreading to other industries. But eventually, law ratified power. Law ratified power. And out of this comes the post-war world, the post-war world that we all are nostalgic for today. Now, this was a world in which job security and life security was guaranteed to a very particular set of workers, white men. White men in the office, white men in the factory, and other people in the fields. And for those who are left out of this new compact, that is women, people of color, migrants, this is a world that guarantees on the one hand for a very particular set of people security, but then very explicitly and very intentionally leaves other people out of it. And this exclusion is fundamental to understanding then both the time of the post-war and then what comes after it. So in the book, I write about the making and unmaking of this workplace, beginning in the 1930s, and then it's remaking from top to bottom. So thinking about the management consultants and the temporary workers and then the migrant workers who were foundational to the reimagination of what work meant after 1970. Their stories begin in the post-war, talking about McKinsey, talking about manpower, talking about the Berceros program. But fundamentally, these worlds intertwine. They are a rehearsal on the backs of people who were not included in this post-war uh, compact for security. And the people whose lives are lived through this moment um, begin to be seen as another way of organizing the workplace. This all comes to a head around 1970, as job stability goes from being something that is celebrated as this quintessential achievement of post-war America to instead becoming a business problem to be solved. These companies, these consultants, offered solutions to dispose of that hard-won security. They doubled down on insecurity instead of trying to contain it. And there's a bright line from this moment as the corporation 
is reimagined from outsourcing to downsizing to subcontracting. There's a bright line between that world and the gig economy and freelance economy of today. Thinking about why work has become so much it's so insecure. So why does this history matter? Why, why should I not just have written a book about today? Well, first of all, I'm a historian, so I think history matters. But the reason I think history matters is because change matters. To understand that technology, of course, determines what's possible. But within all those possibilities exist many different choices over how we can make use of it. And this kind of new organizations that emerge in the 1970s, new ways to structure work through subcontracting, emerge nowhere else as exceptionally as in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, which is held out as a new blueprint, a new roadmap for capitalism after Detroit begins to falter in the 1970s. Now, the stories that we are told of Silicon Valley are the stories of white men, of engineers who are celebrated uh, futurists, the stories of Jobs and Waz and other three-letter names. Um, but the real story of Silicon Valley, as I write about in the book, is just as much about them as it is about the lives of the Chicana women who made motherboards, who many of whom were undocumented workers hiding in closets to, from, to hide from the INS, even as they were essential to the production of this new regime. And so this, an important thread of this book is the kind of work that these new kinds of technologies in electronics, in semiconductors, do to hold out a new kind of corporate and labor model that looks very different from those workers in Flint, those white male workers in Flint. And one of the anecdotes in the story that, at least for me, was very moving was the story of the very first Macintosh factory in 1984. Now, don't feel bad, all of you with Macs in the room. Um, but it's the story that I think reveals a lot about the way in which we talk about the future. We talk about the economy of the future. So the very first Macintosh factory opens in 1984 in Fremont, California. And it's touted as a place where robots are building robots. Machines are building machines. Now, to understand robots in Silicon Valley in the 80s, or even today, is very simple. Every time someone says robot, what they actually mean is woman of color, usually migrant woman of color. And this kind of cultural erasure is crucial because it's about uh, a possible future, an automated future, legitimating that's what robot means. It just means the future. There are no robots, right? It's invoking a future to legitimate a very present inequality, a very different set of experiences. And that's what, where in the first Macintosh factory, you can see all these different threads collide from how certain kinds of workers that are erased, whose work doesn't matter, as well as a new kind of lean production regime that's being first pioneered in Silicon Valley and then exported around the world. Now, I was told to only talk for 10 minutes, so these are all just sort of a brief, uh, yeah, I'm just, just, don't worry, I'm at the end. Um, so, so, these two worlds, this world of corporate reorganization as certain kinds of functions are pushed outside of the main firm, as well as new ideas of legitimating inequality, are the roots of today's insecurity. When we talk about Uber, as I did at the beginning, all these threads, these cultural ideas, the idea of the algorithm, the idea of the future, allowing a very kind of very real um, inequality to exist. But I also think that labor can once again learn a lesson it's forgotten from Uber. Power that slipped from labor's hands, it, it, that made it strong in the 30s and 40s, was replaced by teams of lawyers, a reliance on the state. But it's organization, not law, that made labor powerful. We were reminded of this in the last few years as Uber burst onto the scene. It did this illegally. It drove itself into various markets illegally. And then it created power. 
power through consumers, through buying, you know, through marketing. And then it used the law to ratify itself, to ratify its conquest of these spaces, just as organized labor did in the 1930s. This is how power works. This is it and how it needs to work again. And the best way to ensure a future that empowers workers to restore security is by empowering them, not passing laws. Because in the past, it was not laws that made their lives secure, that made their lives safe, but the power they seized for themselves. And that was as true when they worked in factories as would today when they work in freelancing. So technology is an important part of this story. The ways in which new spaces are used as sites of investment, new kinds of industries, new kinds of gizmos. And, but it doesn't matter as much as these reorganizations. What's new today, what is fundamentally new today, that's a break from the past, is the, de is the fracturing of the corporation. The corporation that has been an enduring site of organization of capital for the last 300 years is suddenly now coming into doubt, is starting to have fractures within it. And in this opportunity, there's also opportunities for power, as we see with this new kind of so-called digital gig economy, but also new opportunities for workers. But the key to it all is not the technology itself, but organization. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much, Lewis, for that. Uh, before we get started, I uh, wanted to introduce also Alex Rosenblatt. She is a researcher here at Data and Society and author of Uberland. Um, so this will be an interesting conversation. <laughs> Great. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, first, um, I did read your book or most of it. And there was, it's a long book, but it was, it was, and it was chock full of a lot of information. So hopefully we can touch on a couple of those issues tonight. And I encourage everyone to please get a copy um, and learn about so many other, so many other businesses and approaches and models there. But um, I wanted to see if you could start by telling us a little about your work and how you came to writing this book and what all went into it. Because like I said, there was a lot in there, but how did you sort of arrive at this particular um, approach about looking at temp? Yeah, so my first two books were about the history of personal debt. And when I was writing those histories from the 19th century to the present, um, it was really about finance. It was about finance and working class finance, middle class finance. Um, and in doing that, I noticed, this, I started this project around 2011, uh, 2010, 2011, and I noticed that so much of that story was really about the increasing insecurity of work. And so I wanted to write that history. Um, my initial love in history was always labor history, and that's how I actually backed into this history of personal debt. But then I also had this experience where um, I worked as a management consultant, I'd worked as a temp, and I think it's always interesting to use your own life experiences to ask questions, not to find answers. Uh, the answers came out of archives, all kinds of crazy, some archives official, some archives back hidden rooms, boxes, um, like the Associated General Contractors of Houston. Uh, they had a, law, a back dusty room I used. Um, so that's sort of how I came to the book. And I just think it's useful to write histories that help us understand where the present came from. That's definitely important. And I think you, you started talking about this in your book, and or in your talk right now. And definitely I saw the theme coming back uh, and over again was this, uh, this account of who counts and who's excluded and in work and labor, and why was that important for you to begin this way? And I think that, that as someone who works in labor, I've seen that, um, but I think it's often maybe not as explicit when we think about labor and movements, but that there is a very clear decision to exclude. Well, I think it's just what happened. So for historians, we usually start with what actually happened, and you can see it everywhere. You have to sort of intentionally avoid seeing race and gender and sexuality in the archives. So there's such a fundamental way in which power is organized under capitalism. Um, and so for me, that was an important part of the story to understand the mechanism of this production about why, and for me, it also started with the contradiction, why all these new kinds of industries, new ways of working began in the midst of a time that 
supposedly was all about guaranteeing job security. And you begin to notice that it's job, not job security for everybody. Um, and certainly for the temp industry, when it begins with manpower, it's talked about as, as women, but of course, eventually by 1960, about 30% of all temps are men. Um, but they're still represented as women again and again. And, and partially, it's about making, you know, how do you do this? Well, you say, well, these people don't matter. These people don't get to have the same kind of security as this other protected group of people. Um, and in the end, of course, that exclusion brings down not just the people who are excluded, but those who are supposedly free or protected, so that white men eventually have this world for working class white men in the 70s and 80s, and then middle class white men in the 80s and 90s, and that world begins to fall apart, and now we're all part of this. So I think it's important as we think about how to rectify the insecurities we live with now, um, we need to make sure that everyone's included as part of that project. Oh, to amplify your point, a lot of Uber's rhetoric for the sharing economy also feminized work by describing it as a supplemental way to earn income. It feminized it by portraying millennials as sort of the face of what was to, to be taxi driving and to sort of indicate that you don't really need the money. You're doing it for fun. Uh, it, some of its rhetoric would be specifically you're doing, you know, Come support your community of writers. <laughs> you know, you're participating in collaborative commerce, um, echoing all the ways that women are expected to do unpaid, but like socially contributing work. Yeah, this idea of the supplement is so fascinating because in the, in the post-war, the way temp labor is sold is your wife goes to work, right? So the assumption is always it's this white woman who's a wife whose real income comes from her husband. Um, and if she does, she gets to buy a color TV. She gets to have a spring in her step and be freed of the existential ennui of the suburbs. Um, and this is, this is so foundational to how it's justified in, in a time when work is supposed to be secure. Um, and yet today, we hear the same language, a supplement. Go drive for Uber and save for vacations. Uh, buy that third television that you really want, that newest PlayStation. But of course, for so many Americans, their incomes are incredibly volatile, right? Job, you know, what was it, the, the J.P. Morgan study, that famous Bolshevik organization? Um, they found that um, among the uh, sort of the median households, a little over 50% of them have month-to-month -month fluctuations of 30% in their income, right? Like the Federal Reserve found that 40% of Americans don't have $400, right? So this idea of supplement really means piecing together lots of different kinds of work. And it's, it's a, but there's a little uh, political meaning to it uh, in terms of extra, imagining that there is this core job. And when you're putting together shifts at Starbucks, at Walmart, managed by algorithms, um, that other part, that supplement, filling it up, trying to make the ends meet, that's where so many Americans work today, and it's, it's a terrifying world. Um, okay, well, you guys started to get into my second question, which is really, you start talking about sort of um, uh, how some of the ideas that Silicon Valley is putting out there. You're, you're saying it's about this sort of, you don't, you're working to earn extra money. But for Silicon Valley, it's it's sharing, right? Or it started out as this idea that is sharing. But I think one of the points you're kind of making in your book is the ideas that are coming out of Silicon Valley really aren't that new. Uh, like nothing, nothing, that, everything new is old. Um, and I, I, I'm wondering if you can talk more about the ideas and the cultural and something that I'm learning here about state and society is social norms that are being changed um, by business leaders that include Manpower and McKinsey, but now are being presented by a lot of companies in Silicon Valley. And for both you and Alex, I'd like to hear how you may or may not see the values and ethos as being different in any way. Um. Yeah, I mean, what, what was so shocking to me when I was doing my research was how this idea of insecure work, temporary work, had to be sold to executives, right? If I told you there was a bunch of workers who you could pay less and get it at any moment with just a simple phone call, you'd be like, let's do this. I'm a corporate overlord. That's exactly what I want, right? I want it when I want it at the lowest possible price. 
Manpower begin the El Elmer Winter, who's the founder of Manpower, who he found his archive and used his papers in the book a lot. Um, he he uh, he had to sell this idea, and he tried to start selling it as early as 1958, um, in the midst of the first post-war recession, where he said things that sound very familiar to us today: that the Chinese are coming, um, that job security is a thing of the past, that none of this you can't have. You cling to these dreams, but you can't have them anymore. And it mostly fell on deaf ears. It mostly fell on corporate leaders who said, no, no, that's not the values we share. We believe that there's a value in having a stable workforce. You can come in and replace us when we're sick or go on vacation or something, but we're not gonna fully subcontract out huge swaths of our workforce. We're making enough money. And this is an important thing to realize that in the 1950s, the top tax bracket um, in today's dollars was about $2 million a year. So as soon as you hit $2 million, 93% of each marginal dollar, additional dollar you got um, was taxed away. So there was no incentive to just you know, crush it, as they say, to further downtown from here. Right? This is, um, this, this is <laughs> you, you, you could not crush it. Uh, you, what you could do was pay people enough to live and believe in technological progress, invest in the future, invest in stability. Um, and these social norms matter a lot. And it took a lot of effort by a lot of different people to convince corporate leaders that this was not the way that corporations ought to be run. And it took a crisis in the late 1960s that I write about extensively in the book, this crisis of the conglomerate form, that allowed consultants and business gurus uh, like Toffler to come in um, and sell ideas about other ways to organize capitalism. And this was an important break. It was a break that wasn't just about the economy, that wasn't just about technology, but was idea break in ideas and organizational ideas that mattered so much. I'm very curious. Um, my head always goes back to the 50s when I'm thinking, and I'm, but as a, as a sort of a contemporary anthropologist, I'm curious how social norms work today. So to give everyone a little bit of context, I spent four years riding around in cars with strange men, and sometimes women, <laughs> and spending a lot of time online every single day in online driver forums where they post screenshots, which are available because of this digitally mediated work, you know, about their workplace culture, which they were developing in spite of not having an actual physical workplace which is pretty fascinating because it means you can crowdsource changes to the app. You can crowdsource and uncover a new pay policy that Uber is experimenting with. And you can do it from across the country and even beyond any specific country. I'd be in a forum where you know it's mostly national US drivers and like a driver from Estonia might pitch in and be like, oh yeah, that's happening. You know, or something like that. Like you can share different features of the app from different places. And what was really fascinating to me from this workplace culture is how much it demonstrated that Uber could leverage significant control over how drivers behaved at work because they were constantly hemmed in in different ways. They had to meet certain threshold requirements for how they would behave around dispatches. You might have to accept 90% of ride requests and your cancellation rate had to be low. And this was really interesting because it contradicted another kind of Silicon Valley rhetoric about what it meant to work for a company like Uber. You weren't there exactly to be employed in any traditional sense. You were there to be an entrepreneur. You were an independent contractor by classification, and you were billed as this sort of freewheeling millennial supplemental earner who was initially just contributing to your community of riders in a sharing economy, a weirdly successful part like propaganda. Um, and the appeal of that propaganda is really rooted in the fact that Uber took off and the sharing economy sort of launched in the aftermath of the Great Recession when a lot of people were experiencing job losses, for cities were experiencing blight and foreclosure crises, and Silicon Valley had a solution, which they often do. They're known for that. And they said, we have the technology to scale entrepreneurship for the masses, which drew not just on what technology can do, but on a larger American dream of being able to sort of pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, to be independent, to have that kind of freedom. And that's exactly what Uber <laughs> marketed for drivers. What I would see in interviewing drivers across more than 25 cities in the US and Canada and in online forums 
was that their behavior was actually constrained. They couldn't make decisions that were always in their optimal economic interest. They didn't have the information they needed, and they didn't have the power, because if they did try and optimize to their own interests, such as by only accepting trips with, that were lucrative, you know, they could be deactivated, a technology word that means suspended or fired. But a lot of what I've seen Uber do, and other red hail companies too, is use the language of technology to create cultural change in systems of law and systems of power. Because you can use the language of technology and the practices of it to distance yourself from the legal relationships that we typically expect to moderate a workplace with. And so in classifying drivers as independent contractors, billing them as entrepreneurs, offering technology as a solution to like job losses <laughs> and to economic recovery, and by drawing on lots of different kinds of myths simultaneously, it, uh, you know, Uber created a separate system and offered a model where drivers could actually be managed by algorithms. They don't have human supervisors who tell them what to do. They have algorithms that enact the rules that Uber sets for how drivers have to behave on the job. And then you have like a whole lot of people looking at that model to say, how much of this is really different? How much of this is the same? Uh, is this new technology really changing the way we do things? Are these old things covered in like new technology language? And they, while they do achieve some cultural difference, like you can manage drivers with algorithms that may be enough to move like, workers away from the traditional workplace protections that might govern their workplace. Like You might be able to get away with calling lots of people independent contractors as long as you're managing them with algorithms or with the rhetoric of technology. And that, to me, is a quite striking social change or cultural change because it sets a precedent not just for the taxi industry where it's kind of normal for this to be the workplace relations. Like taxi drivers are also independent contractors and also have to subscribe to a lot of rules, but those rules are often set by government. There's regulations that sort of look very similar to <laughs> some of the rules that drivers might have to su subscribe to in a ride hail workplace. Um, but what Uber's creating isn't just a workplace for drivers. It's become a symbol of digital change and the model that other industries can draw upon to implement changes to their own workplaces as well. No, I don't want to rebuttal. I want to sort of build uh, on what Alex is saying. Yeah, no, I think I think it's important to think about. Like, no, no, there's no fight. Okay, there'll be a fight, but that, um, no, I think that this is important, right? So, who gets protected by the law? Like, in a lot of ways, the anxieties over this are about men who are taxi drivers losing their jobs, um, which no one really cared about the depreciation of a car when it was teenagers driving for Domino's, right? Because their jobs don't matter. No one really cared when it was undocumented workers, um, you know, in Silicon Valley. You know, one of the important thing to realize, I talk, or I talk about in the story that was really striking to me was how the INS opened a field office in 1984 to regulate what they th thought of as hundreds of thousands of undocumented workers in electronics who were doing work that was outside of the law, uh, and this is the only way that work could be done in the US was doing it outside of the law. Uh, various kinds of toxic labor, and it wasn't really about the money, it was about being in control. It was about um, sort of avoiding those kinds of regulations. OSHA was new at that point. Um, and trying to figure out how to make the economy. So this, yeah, this goes back to your point that this is an old story in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, and thinking about the values of Silicon Valley. Sorry. The only thing that I've seen that's sort of new is this this kind of like g gaming of work that is very unique to you know the 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 developers and the the engineers in 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 Silicon Valley. Those kind of ideas got baked into a lot of the technology that now moderates work. And I'm not really sure what to think about it. I don't know that it's an it's a an ideal that they they that is somehow about work necessarily, but it is being integrated into work and we're seeing that. Well, I think, I think it comes out of thinking about things from first principles, which is sort of a basic engineering mindset. You know, how do you do something? You don't read a book about it. You reason it out from first principles, right? And then consultants are the same way, right? Um, and, but in that are a set of values. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting is to think about how programming languages set the stage for a certain way of thinking about work. So the valorization of abstraction, the valorization of encapsulation, 
you can think of as pretty analogous to subcontracting. Um, I don't want to know who's doing this work, who, how these actual parts get dipped in these toxic vats and brought back. Oh, I'll just have a temp uh, go collect them from some other company that I've never thought about before. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, and it's understandable, right? We all have mental models. This isn't some sort of evil, nefarious plot, but it does have these evil, nefarious consequences um, about certain people's lives not being protected. So I think there is something to that, that kind of mindset. And I, I saw that in other parts of your book when you talk about wh wh when it was the consultants doing it versus when the accountants really leading the structural change versus the bureaucratic stages. So now we're in sort of an engineering stage, uh, engineers sort of potentially transforming aspects of work. Um, so I have actually two more questions, and I think we may be running out of time, but hopefully we can get through this. So I really want you to talk about and tell the story about efforts to organize temp workers um, by organizations like 9 to 5, which I'm familiar with, but others. And you s allude to the challenges of organizing part-time workers who are all over the place, don't really have one employer, and whether we see efforts to organize drivers similarly, what might, in, in, in non-standard work arrangements, and what do you think this is or could be different now, and what other contract workers that aren't necessarily temps but also precarious or contingent? Yeah, uh, an important part of labor history is the celebration of labor movements. Uh, that hit labor historians often write these sort of amazing stories of struggle and achievement, and part of what I'm writing is a story of failure um, in a lot of ways. The story is not about uh, sort of why temp workers couldn't be organized. So there, there is this amazing organization, 9 to 5, um, which you're probably familiar with if you're not a labor historian, from the, either the movie 9 to 5 or the amazing Dolly Parton song 9 to 5. Um, this is based on an actual labor movement, an actual labor movement in the 70s that was pioneered by two secretaries uh, at Harvard University. The idea being that they wanted to organize working women. They organized women, working women in publishing and finance, but one of the areas they tried to do was organize temp workers. Um, and they even collaborated with the SEIU to do this. It didn't work at all. It was a failure. And I think that failure is pretty interesting in thinking about today's issues. How do you organize a distributed workforce? How do you, you know, if the organizing principle of the, you know, the 19th century was craft labor, uh, you're a carpenter or a bricklayer. We have labor unions for that. That's called the AFL. Um, then the organizing principle of capitalism is industrial labor. Well, uh, the AFL says you can never do that. Well, the CIO comes in the 1930s and begins to organize semi-skilled and unskilled workers by industrial site and then by industry. Well, since 1970, really the rise of Walmart, containerization, we've seen capitalism is now organized by supply chains. You know, what we call today logistical workers. Um, and this is the natural organizing unit of capitalism today. And yet we don't have analogous systems for organizing workers in that way because it's illegal. It's illegal in the US to do this, coming out of um, Taft Hartley the ta after World War II. And so we don't have labor strength that comes out of this. And so 9 to 5, I think, is the first time you ch people attempt to organize this distributed temporary workforce. Um, and it's, I think it's the first step towards thinking about these issues, about how do you organize people across many different workforces. And of course, today, I'm sure Alex can talk better about this than I can, um, people are trying to do that in new ways. You have coworker.org, you have various kinds of forums, Reddit as this sort of vanguard of activism and other very frightening things. Um, you know, but I think this is the question of our age. How do you organize across a supply chain? How do you organize similar workers across disparate workplaces? And there's no uh, roadmap for that exactly from the past. But we do know what has worked in the past is thinking strategically about vulnerabilities in capitalism and thinking about those connections between workers and using power. I'm curious what Alex thinks about that. I want to talk about a moment a few months ago where drivers started receiving checks from the Federal Trade Commission. And they were posting them to online forums. And they were like, I don't remember signing up for this class action lawsuit. What is this? What it was is that throughout 2014, 2015, and even earlier, Uber had recruited drivers with exaggerated earnings claims. You might remember a very widely disseminated uh, claim Uber made that drivers were going to make over $90,000 a year, which seemed to 
provide substantive heft to the idea that it was going to scale entrepreneurship for the masses and create a pathway towards the middle class in a country that was really shaken by the Great Recession. And drivers started getting these checks a couple of years later because Uber settled with the FTC for $20 million. And that's what it was from. But the remarkable thing was that there was no connection between the remedy and the harm. There was no win for an organizer. There was no sort of credit. It was like just sort of like, oh, okay, I got this check. And like Uber has lots of lawsuits, so maybe it's like from something like that. Um, and that was really remarkable to me because it, it, it demonstrated a real vacuum that even when there is a remedy to a harm, it's, it's so removed from any sort of cultural logic <laughs> or any internal logic of struggle. And it lacks that valorization and that sense of accomplishment that you can have if you do win and fight for something in a more direct way. Can I ask you a question, Alex? Yes, you may. Uh, $20 million, what is that in the, in the monthly burn rate of Uber? <laughs> It's not very much money. Um, th I think they were just trying to do it for drivers who were affected at that time for exaggerated Yeah, earnings. I mean, in, I think it's, this is a long history, right, where there's these elaborate class action cases, like the Microsoft cases of the 90s, that really set the stage um, for th the idea of independent contractors today. Well, Microsoft lost, and they had to pay, I think it was like $90 million or something which is a rounding error in like their, you know, their, their water bottle budget or something. It's like just nothing in the 90s, right, for Microsoft. I think this is one of the things, like you can go through all this stuff and then nothing really changes. Nothing really changes. It's one of the uh, failures of, of the system today. The other thing I was going to mention is that there's a culture in America that valorizes independence. And I think a lot of the drivers I've spoken with um, except maybe in cities where there has been sort of more cultural momentum around organizing, like in Seattle, they're not particularly interested in being, you know, reclassified, although they might be interested in having their expenses covered. So there's like a real divide in what these debates are about and what that could actually mean at the end of the day for a driver. But a lot of drivers, you know, they don't want to be inside a traditional workplace. There's people who have moved out of factories or out of call centers because they want to be removed from that more, uh, like, physical human supervision that they experience it at, in a workplace. And they might appreciate the independence they have to set their own schedule, although that comes with a lot of caveats because if you're dependent on this income to support your family, you have to really tailor when you work to when there's higher demand because the base rates aren't high enough and so drivers will work when they have incentives to work at particular places at particular times. Um, but there is a, a valorization of independence that they might strive for even if they don't actively have it. And that is placed sort of in tension with efforts at collective action. And so there's a cultural thread to this that I think is important to address, maybe just because it's a specific type of workplace. Like a lot of people in like an occupation of driving are people who wanted to be out on the road. Um, although there's a lot of people who are part of this workplace who have no previous experience as occupational drivers. You know, New York City is an exception because a lot of the drivers came from the taxi industry, the cost of entry is higher, and so most people are doing it, like the majority of people are doing it full time, unlike in other places where the cost of entry is, is lower and you don't need to go through you know, a New York Taxi and Limousine Commission or its equivalent. Uh, but where you get people across the board, people who are economically dependent and people who are not because they have a job as an engineer, you know, and they're driving around for fun and to make new social connections and they give their spare earnings to their daughter to buy stuff on Amazon, they're still impacted by issues of unfairness across the board. So even if they are, like they're not as worried about exploitation, they're worried about unfairness. So if you're not paid for all 11 trips you did and you're only paid for 10, that still bothers you even if you're not economically dependent on your earnings. And I think part of what the like faceless boss brings to bear on this and the opacity that you were describing earlier, it's that there's no one to turn to to address your grievances with. And so unfairness and the feeling of it is almost amplified because you can't really address it fully. Within the Uber model, uh, drivers who experienced harassment or pay, like, pay issues, they would, for the most of the time that I was studying Uber, have to write to a remote customer service agent sometimes located in the Philippines, and they'd get a form letter back after they were sexually harassed. 
you know, or something else happened. And so there was just this like institutional distrust that built up over the company through these series of steps that helped to automate management. Like that's Uber's like principal innovation here is that they have these algorithmic managers and they found ways of scaling work opportunities and jobs and services with like limited humans in the loop, but it comes at a cost and it creates perhaps the feeling of unfairness that might be more broadly addressed, not just in labor, but also in, in like other areas of society where people are affected by large technology institutions like platforms, like Facebook, like Google, where you're just an individual disempowered user and you have really no ability to intervene in this larger platform, except in some kind of aggregate. And so what I keep like seeing echoes of is the struggles that drivers are facing are not wholly removed from like the disempowerment consumers might also experience through similar technologies. Last word. Oh yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I oh, yeah, sure, sure. Just very briefly, I mean, I think this is. I think the American values of autonomy and independence are both real, and I believe in them. You're, I'm an American. You're a Canadian. You know, uh, I there's something. You know, something like this really speak. Yeah, exactly. No, no, and I love Canada. The uh, but I do think that there's something about that that this idea of how do we combine flexibility and security and autonomy and self determination. These are very core American values that you know haven't always been realized in practice, but still are sort of very powerful drivers. You know, I, and as we think about this, is one of the things I think history can be useful for. Uh, you know, we often talk about comparing this economy with the industrial economy, but the better analogy is really the agricultural economy. So when I think about the 70s and 80s, and by 70s, I mean the 1870s and 1880s, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the farmers who are promised autonomy in the West. They borrow money to buy land, they borrow money to buy threshers, um, and suddenly they find, actually, they're not so autonomous after all. They're in debt to Eastern interests. The equivalent of platform economy companies of that age, which were railroads that controlled all the rates, you know, um, they were like, well, how can I be free if I can't control the rates in the railroad or move my grain? And I'm in debt and I can't buy my mortgages. And actually, year after year, there's deflation and I'm more and more in debt. So it almost is like deja vu for the historian. But what comes out of that is the Grange movement. What comes out of that is the populist movement, these collab collective activities to sustain autonomy. And they forge new kinds of institutions to connect with each other using new kinds of uh, technology, like the telegraph, um, to connect with one another. And over time, it's a long struggle, but many of the things they demand come to be law, come to be uh, their powerful acts of power, their political power, becomes ratified in the system that begins to deliver more equity to them. Now, it doesn't work out great, um, but I think it's something we can think about um, as we think about these issues going forward. Sorry to rant on. Should we ask questions? We have like two minutes or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyone has a question, please raise their hand, and Rigo will bring the mic around to you. My name is Eva, for practical purposes. Uh, I like the focus on organization and, and how that has played along. And I'm wondering with organized labor, why have they failed or how could they adapt better to become supportive and inclusive of this new movement, which very clearly is in need of some organizing principles or body to, to rely to? That's a great question. Why does organized labor fail to organize the new economy? Um, and I think it's interesting because so many of the people who are at the forefront of trying to rethink these issues are ex-SEIU uh, employees, right? So you think about many of the people are actually, they try to go to the labor movement, it doesn't work. And the failure, to me, is comparable to the failure of the American Federa Federation of Labor in the 1920s, which was on its deathbed. It was being replaced by company unions everywhere. It was failing, flailing about. They, it had no way to organize steel or auto or any of the new industries. And it really took people to say, you know what? We're in the Great Depression, we're done, our backs are to the wall, we're just gonna do it on our own. It took people to just go out there and say, we're gonna organize in a way we haven't organized before. And it may or may not be legal, but it is powerful. And it is the way that capital is being organized by industry. And that story of how labor is successful when it mirrors the organization of capital. Um, is an old story and I think is essential today. And so rather than thinking, oh, labor has failed, it's like, no, 
people are figuring it out. They're figuring out how to do it, right? People have probably talked in this room are trying to figure out how to do it today and how to use technology to empower new forms of counter-organization. I think it's, but I think this is the, to realize it's not a yes or no kind of thing. It's, it's about how do you continue that struggle? Yeah, please. I, I just want to add really quickly to that, that it's not just dependent on labor unions. I think some of the most interesting organizing is with worker rights groups and even, you know, sex workers. They're really pushing the boundaries of law that excluded them. So this is where a lot of change is going to happen when you start, you know, the wage theft movement is, if you ask a lot of people, some would say we already have wage theft laws. It's, that's what the wa wage and hour divisions are supposed to do. But they're, who actually accesses that? The only people who are really able to access that are those who have the resources. So it was necessary to fight for wage theft laws at the local level to reincorporate and give power back to workers who have been excluded, like women, like migrant workers, like you know black and brown workers. So I think it's it's a, a multi-pronged approach, and I think that there's a role actually for community, connecting community issues to labor issues more strongly. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ken Miles, um, you had mentioned earlier, you said history matters because change matters, and I guess I was thinking a lot on that quote in the context of like this re revisionist history kind of you know, disinformation, fake news, all that stuff. As a historian, how have you seen that kind of manifest through a historical lens, right? You said there are so many avenues that you can kind of dissect history through. So do we end up in this place where you're digging through dusty crates in a Texas back room only to then be pre present something that gets deconstructed even further? And how far, the, how much, how much farther does that bring us or take us away from the place we aim to get to at a time where management is disembodied and faceless and kind of curious from your lens as a historian if that's an emerging concern of yours? Um, well, I think, I, thank you for the question. Yeah, I, for me, truth matters, reality matters. I'm a barefoot empiricist in the archive. You know, I have hypotheses about how things happen, and then I go in there and I read documents and it either confirms or denies that. And, and that's a little naive, right? Especially from an STS perspective, you know, and I think there's been a whole, it, it's never complete, yeah, but I, I guess I'm comfortable with that. It's an incomplete kind of knowledge. It's a narrative knowledge, which apparently isn't real. It's also a delusion we all have. I read it in this New York Times. But I also think stories are uh, how we humans organize information. Um, and at least for me, you know, I want to tell stories that, you know, I don't always, I, what I argue in the book isn't where I started in a lot of ways. Right? I didn't start with the idea. I thought I was going to write a book where um, it, you know, this new workforce was bad. It was really bad. But I think there's a lot of opportunities in it, too. Right? Just, like, just like there's opportunities in industrial work that you know, many thought was bad when people left the farm. Right? Um, so I think that it's about uh, being open to new information, complicating one's accepted ideas. And for me, this is um, the pleasure of the archive. Like, realizing I'm wrong, um, realizing that there's another thing I have to account for. Um, and I, I'm terrified of fake news, this idea that there is no truth, that there, everything is just made up by interests, where I think you do have to hold yourself accountable to data uh, if you want to be part of society, uh, if, if, I, if I could pawn a little. Uh, yeah, but that's a, that's a good question. Historians are very worried about it. My friends, my colleagues who are historians of science are, are in this wholesale uh, revolt against everyone who trained them in graduate school, um, who are just like, no, science is real. I'm sorry, Bruno Latour. And Bruno Latour has even got dialed back. He's like, I never said that. It's like, well, people, people thought you did, buddy. Um, science is real. How do we think about that and create new kinds of truths um, that you know, help us understand the world better? And I, yeah, I believe in that. And maybe it's old fashioned and but I do think we need to defend the Enlightenment in a lot of ways that we weren't doing uh, for many decades. One more question. Uh, 
this is super fun for me. Um, so Eileen Clancy, so thanks so much both to Alex and Lewis. Um, and I certainly agree with you uh, about the need to, the power coming from organization. So if you could bear with me uh, just to talk history for a moment. So I do um, a history of computing, history of science, and I'm looking particularly in the aeronautical industry more like the 50s and 60s. And so what I found is sort of the hidden figures thing, the, the movie, the book, not the movie, because it actually does go back to the 50s, is there's actually quite a, a significant number of women and some women of color working in various capacities in the aeronautical industry and in those just like hidden figures, like those air, those like about a dozen um, US aeronautical labs that are government facilities, but that's actually the smaller piece of it. So. I'm just wondering how that fits with your, I'm not trying to be tendentious or challenge you at all, but <laughs> I'm just sort of saying. As long as you don't it, hit me, it's fine. You no, know, we're good, we're good. So uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to hurt you. But basically, if, we're, if you, you're, you're saying that it was like a blueprint, the Silicon Valley blueprint was, was, was working with, with these folks. But so I'm seeing it as actually, there's people who are not white men working in those places and they're, they're making, um, Often the analog computer parts for, um, uh, um, you know, uh, basically fancy military planes, guidance systems. So they're doing that, and they're doing like a lot of like small kind of piecework kind of things, right? Um, not motherboards, but you know, are related. So I don't know if you've looked at that or if how it fits in. If it does, no, aerospace is fascinating because uh, it just appears out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, we feel like we live in this. We'll talk later. Oh, okay. Well, it, it, you know, it goes from being. A, Right now I'm terrified. And now it goes from being a garage industry employs less than uh, the number of candy manufacturing workers in 1936 to being within five years the largest industry in America. Right? It sort of becomes this massive industry almost overnight through government intervention uh, during World War II. And not in the sense of government intervention um, that the government uh, is just a big consumer, but also the way in which they act as a channel for capital. So they connect all this idle capital on Wall Street, they channel it into these new technologically advanced industries. It's an amazing case study for that. Yeah, women work, women are scientists, women do all kinds of, women, um, the, the sort of head of um, Macy's and Mar Margaret Getchell in the late 19th century was, um, was as a woman. You know, there's lots of people, but I think the main thrust is these are exceptions to a rule that really privileges uh, men re over women in many different capacities, which is true today. I mean, I don't think that's like a novel suggestion. Um, I, d I do think that it's interesting to think about the proliferation of aerospace as a way of m metastasizing industry through, a m through the West. When you think about sort of the uh, wholesale creation of the LA aerospace industry in the 1940s, you know, as a precursor to electronics in a lot of ways, that, but yet somehow they don't ever quite organize in the same way that Detroit does. And so California, Texas, these are places that, Omaha, these are places that are the sites of aerospace, but never quite make that shift like you have in the industrial Northeast for a variety of reasons, both legal and social and cultural. Um, but yeah, it's an, it's an important point. All right, thank you. One last thank you for Lewis and Alex. Um,